Good afternoon. Thank you very much for um, inviting me to Kedron Brook, to Brisbane, to talk to you on, on this subject, or indeed on, on any topic. I'm from San Francisco, as our brother announced, and I should certainly extend to you, and they would want me to, the loving greetings of the members of the San Francisco Peninsula Ecclesia. San Francisco, as you probably know, is an international hub for air travel, so many of you, when traveling, may well be directed through there. Please feel free to take some extra time off to come and uh, visit visit us there and come and spend some time with us. A lot of Australians and New Zealanders do that as they come through from this direction and uh, we're always delighted uh, to have them with us. So um, this afternoon we're looking at the subject, uh, the uh, sign of the dove. And in case it's not immediately obvious, I'll, I'll point out why uh, that's the title for a study of Jonah. I'm sure many of you know the Hebrew word for dove is Yonah, which we pronounce Jonah. So his name is dove. So this isn't a sort of a, 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 any form of metaphor. This is a direct translation of the Hebrew word. There is a man in biblical history whose name was dove. That is such an unusual name both then and now, even though many people are called Jonah after the Hebrew word, we still don't hardly anyone, ever meet anyone whose first name is Dove. It's quite possible that that wasn't actually his real name. It's quite possible that was a name that God gave him for the biblical record because of his story. And because his story so well mapped out what people needed to know and understand when God spoke about doves, that God gave him the name Dove. It may have been his actual name, I don't mind either way. The story of Jonah itself is very dramatic and very well known, uh, and because it's so dramatic, it's very commonly used as a Sunday school uh, story for the children. In fact, as it happens, in San Francisco where I came from, the very last Sunday, our Sunday school were enacting, or due to enact a play of Jonah somewhat like David and Goliath and some of the others, Daniel in the, in the lion's den. It's such a dramatic story, we give it to the children understandably because it really grabs the attention. However, we shouldn't as adults be misled. It's very easy to think, ah, well, if this is indeed a children's story, it probably doesn't have the depth and complexity to be worthy of adult study. And that's, a, that's an easy trap to fall into in any of those examples. And nothing could be further from the truth uh, when it comes to studying the man called Dove, because he is an extremely unusual and an extremely complicated character, even though the story we have about him is incredibly short. It's arbitrarily divided into four chapters, but the whole thing is easily read in a single setting. What then do we know about him? First, the obvious fact we've already said, Yonah is the Hebrew word meaning Dove. This is his name, okay? Well, We'll think more about what that means later. We know that he's the son of Amittai, because it says so in the opening sentence of that book. And that's normal to have men introduced uh, with their heritage. And what may uh, not be quite as well known is that Jonah shows up twice in the Bible. Yes, there's the entire book about him, the book called Dove, if you will, but he also shows up very briefly in the book of 2 Kings. Not worthy of us turning it up just yet, I, I think, just to mention that he's there delivering a prophecy in the northern part of Israel in 2 Kings 14. And that's helpful because we get to know his hometown. We learn that his hometown is Gath Hepha. And that's not a name that is uh, notable for any particular events or character. We just learn that. And then we, when we go back to Joshua and start tracing out the division of the land, we can then conclude Gath Hepha is in the territory of Zebulun. So by following a few little routes like that and cunningly turning up a few scriptures, we've learned something interesting. Jonah is from the tribe of Zebulun. Now, that's a determined fact, and it ends up being, or it seems to end up being, a very disappointing fact. Why? Because what does that mean? If you like, why, why do we care that we've discovered that? Some of the 12 tribes of Israel have very distinct characteristics, don't they? If you're from the tribe of Judah, that has a certain flavor to it. Judah was the king's tribe. King David was from Judah. And more importantly, the line of Jesus of Nazareth came from Judah. 
Some of the other tribes had distinct characteristics and flavors to them. Leviticus was the tribe of priests. Reuben was the firstborn. So he was the one that sort of modeled human failure. That's the, the, the eternal story in scripture. First comes man's effort and it falls flat on its face. And then God's grace comes and says, why don't we try again uh, using what I said in the first place? And that's something we're going to see very clearly in the book of Jonah. But Zebulun, um, he's one of those sort of also ran tribes, isn't he? We don't really have anything significant or signature about Issachar or Zebulun or Gad or some of the others. So it doesn't seem to give us any flavor to Jonah's character. But in actual fact, it will prove very interesting. So I'm just going to ask you, stick that fact on a mental shelf somewhere that Jonah is of the tribe of Zebulun, and we'll come back for it later. Let's introduce Jonah from his chronological perspective. This will be well known to everyone, but I just want to make sure it's clear. In the middle of that slide there are the numbers, that's the years, progressing from left to right, getting smaller, of course, as time goes forward, because that's uh, years before Christ. And you have in green there uh, the, uh, something that's supposed to represent the length of the kingdom of Israel, or the kingdom of God, if you will, uh, uh, as Israel under King Saul, King David, and King Solomon. And it wasn't long before that kingdom divided because of Rehobo Rehoboam's foolishness. And 10 of the 12 tribes revolted. And they followed Jeroboam. And they took the name of Israel. And they're shown by that yellow bar. And there was a southern kingdom. And the southern kingdom was the faithful kingdom. That was just the two tribes of Judah and Benjamin, and they followed under Rehoboam. And that kingdom lasts a great deal longer, as you can see from the slide, before they disappear into captivity. Israel disappears here, and Judah lasts a lot longer. And to some extent, Judah sort of comes back, at least when they rebuild Jerusalem in the time of uh, the Iranian or Persian Empire. Why is that useful to us? It's useful because it allows us just to, just to see where the minor prophets land. About nine out of 12 of the minor prophets are all preaching in that southern kingdom. There's actually a hint of a spiritual lesson there. The more you listen to God, the more God talks to you. Sounds almost unfair, doesn't it? That the ones who don't listen to God are the ones who need him, but that's never the way God's worked. The less you listen to me, says God, the less I'll talk to you. And the more you listen to me, the more I'll talk to you. So that he that has shall have more and have abundance, but he that has not shall be taken away even that he has. It's a parable Jesus says. So nine of the prophets are actually in the uh, more faithful kingdom in the south, and three are in the northern kingdom of Israel, and Jonah is one of those three. So if you want to remember Jonah in a sort of a triplet form with his two sort of fellows, really Hosea, Jonah, and Amos are the three that go together. If you're anything like me, you probably got the triplet of Hosea, Joel, and Amos in your, in your mind because that's the order of the books, isn't it? When you're trying to remember the minor prophets as books, you remember Hosea, Joel, Amos, and there's some more, and you generally forget about them. But I would recommend try and, try and get Hosea, Jonah, and Amos into your mind as three together because those three are vaguely contemporary and certainly coincident. They're all of the northern kingdom. In fact, beyond that, Jonah has one signature uniqueness and a really important one. And it's the people to whom he preached. Yes, he was in the northern kingdom. And yes, he did preach a message of prophecy to the northern kingdom of Israel uh, around that time of two kings. But really, he had a unique position. So what I've shown there, and the artwork in the background, by the way, for those of you who might know uh, Brother Dev Ramsharan from, uh, from Canada, from the Toronto area. This is his artwork that I'm using, with permission, I assure you, that'll crop up at various points during the, the show, a very sort of striking but simple line, line drawing there. In blue, you can see the prophets that ministered to the Northern Kingdom. In purple, uh, very many more prophets who ministered to the Southern Kingdom. But Jonah is shown in red because Jonah preached to a unique group of people. And what was that group of people? Someone can tell me. The Ninevites, or if you like to be more general, Gentiles. So Jonah was sent, the dove was sent to the Gentiles. This idea that God's salvation and God's love and his blessings was not limited to Israel dates from the beginning of time. It's certainly not a New Testament idea. It's not a, quotes, Christian idea in terms of coming from Jesus the Christ. It has always been God's plan to reach out to all ethnicities, 
all cultures, all races, provided they have the same common faith and belief in his hope. So who started that ball rolling? In actual fact, God selected the dove, if you will, to start that and sending him to, as a prophet to the Gentiles. So then, we've met uh, Jonah in, in those contexts of nationality and of preaching segregation and such like in chronology. Let's meet the man personally. And these are the words that uh, Brother David has already read for us. God says to Jonah, go northeast to Nineveh and bring my message against it. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. That's also unique. There is no other prophet of God that we meet in anywhere in the Old Testament who is openly, willfully disobedient to God. Some push back and say, oh, must I really do that? That's too hard for me. And God helps them out by often softening the message or softening the circumstances in which they must operate. But Jonah is unique. He's the prophet who says, nope, not going to do that. Turns around and literally takes off in the opposite direction. So that can make Jonah a very interesting person. We could say, oh, well, he's a wicked prophet then. It's a snap judgment. Has some truth to it. We can say, we could say perhaps more valuable, that's someone we can probably identify with a little bit e more easily. Someone who, who knows precisely what God's will is and says, no, I, I don't actually want to do that. I want to do the opposite. Because that's someone that I recognize because I see him in the mirror each morning. So when I, I read of someone like Jonah, I'm like, that's interesting. Here's a man who wouldn't do God's will. He knew precisely what it was and he wouldn't do it. That's a man I can connect with. It's not something we should glorify or encourage or copy for sure but it's something we can connect with. But lest we be too harsh on Jonah and just say, look, a sinner, someone doing the wrong thing, which is true, let's see if we can empathize with why Jonah immediately says, no, I am not gonna do that. I'm going the other way. Here's what was going on at the time. So I've shown three countries on the map there. I hope that's vaguely uh, discernible. Israel is shown in green. And the little triangle within the green region is the rough position of Jerusalem, their capital city. And Syria, somewhat the dominant force at the time, uh, are shown in blue, owning a bigger area. And their capital city is Damascus, as it is to this day. And Assyria, a different nation, a nation no longer in existence, uh, is shown in yellow to the northeast there, with Nineveh its capital. And what happens here, if you watch the blue very closely, is that Syria invades northern Israel and takes some of the territory, okay? And that obviously is, you know, a nation is invaded. That's a, that's a disaster, loss of life. This is a very worrying thing. And that's where Jonah first shows up in the Bible record. Jonah, with a J there, and Elisha both bring a message to Israel, a message of consolation. Don't worry, they say, don't panic. I realize you've been invaded, lives have been lost. This is a genuine tragedy. God has not forgotten you. Israel will be liberated from this Syrian power is, is a very approximate summary of the message. And God, true to his word, does liberate them from the Syrian power. Israel does not overcome Syria right away. Instead, what happens from behind them is Assyria explodes in power and dominance, particularly towards the southwest, crashes through Syria, takes even their capital city of Damascus, and then you have that thin strip of blue, which is a Syrian invaded force, which is cut off from behind from their supply lines, against which now the Israelites can push back successfully and recapture their territory. And that's what happens historically. Do you notice something new there? Green and yellow now touch, and they never did before. They have new neighbors, and, and in that time, and possibly even, arguably even now in the 21st century, that means new enemies. They are face to face with a new and extremely powerful enemy. However, because, they've just, because Israel have just won back their land, they're victorious, they're celebrating. And what happens when humans win and celebrate? What happens is God immediately gets thrown out of the window. Everything's happy again. We don't need God anymore. And so the Israelites decay in their moral behavior. And that's when the two contemporaries of Jonah, Hosea and Amos, come along to deliver a new message of prophecy to northern Israel that says, you guys are misbehaving, cut it out. And Hosea is given the metaphor of an adulterous wife to a faithful husband. God is your faithful husband, and you are like an adulterous wife cheating on him. 
And Amos is given the metaphor of buildings that are built crooked. And he goes around with his plumb line saying, you guys are like a bunch of buildings and not a single wall is straight. Israel is now adulterous and misaligned. And it's at this point, why have we gone through that history? Why? Because it's at this point that Jonah is told, now go to Nineveh and tell them they will be destroyed unless they repent. Bring my message of prophecy against Nineveh. So do we understand now why Jonah won't do it? What's the normal human response here? I'll take suggestions. He's scared. Scared of what, Hung? You're right. What's he scared of? It's, yeah, his life. I think Jonah rightly calculates, speaking in human terms, if he goes to Nineveh, this massive Assyrian power, and say, you better watch out, else my God's going to get you, he is going to have the lifespan of a mayfly. Think of a corollary, and this probably doesn't match on every level, but the modern superpower is the United States. And the United States has recently trampled over certain Middle Eastern countries. God knows what he's doing, but that's what's happening. So it would be the equivalent of someone in Iraq being told, go to the middle of America, go to Texas, and wave your Iraqi finger in their face and tell them they better watch out, else the Iraqi God is going to get them. This is the 21st century. We're technically civilized. That person's going to be lynched, sadly. Such is humanity, right? So Jonah thinks, I'm not going to last five minutes. I'm being sent into enemy territory. And what is another reason why he might not want to go and preach God's message of what they have to do to be saved? Because they might repent. What would happen if they repented? They might be able to take the, the, the northern kingdom. But in general, what happens if you repent before God? You get forgiveness. So what does he not want them to have? Forgiveness. Realize these are the enemy. These have invaded his these are, are people who will invade his land and kill his kinsmen. I don't think Jonah wants them to be saved. We can see elements of, of, of bigotry even in the twenty first century between nations. Oh, these are my people, I want them to live. That's another nation. I don't care if they all die. So Jonah's being presented with a very difficult task of saying, go to your enemies. Go to your enemies who are bigger than you. Go to your enemies that are stronger than you and tell them, I want to try and work with you so that your lives can be saved. It's a very real, this is why, this isn't just a children's story. I wouldn't do this in Sunday school. This is striking at the heart of what we're called to do. Because we're not just here to look at some guy from 850 BC. That's valueless. We're here to examine ourselves and we're here to grow ourselves. Do we have the desire to go to our enemies and say, I want to work with you so that you can be saved? And you're bigger than me and you're stronger than me and if you want to wipe me out, you can in a hot second. That's what Jonah was challenged with. And to some extent, that's what we're challenged with. So there was his charge to preach and he rejected it, said, no thanks, don't want to have any part of that. Jonah evades the mission, but perhaps as humans, we can understand why. He thinks he'll be killed. And besides, they're Assyrian, thank you very much. Why should the Assyrians, who are about to trample through his country, get God's grace and God's salvation and God's forgiveness and life? He doesn't want that. And so we're working with a very real human being. And that's what makes him like you and me. So Jonah decides to run away from God's presence. So we can pose the question, is that even possible? Is it even possible to flee the presence of God? Interesting, the hymn that was chosen, our uh, presiding brother took great care, obviously. There was a lot of thought in that hymn about how one cannot escape the presence of God. Here's a quote that I like. And again, look at, look at where this quote comes from. Amos. It was Jonah's contemporary. As Jonah is hot-footing it down to Joppa to go catch a ship to Tarshish, Amos may be standing on the street corner that same afternoon preaching exactly this. You can't get away from God. Not one will get away. None will escape. Though they dig down to the depths of the grave. And I've noted the, the Hebrew word for dig there, chorthar. Remember that, it'll crop up in just a minute. 
From there, my hand will take them. You can hide on top of Mount Carmel. I've got you. I'll take you there. Though you can hide at the bottom of the sea, I will command the serpent, Nahash, the uh, gentleman from the Garden of Eden, to bite you at the bottom of the sea. Can one flee God's presence? No. So to some extent, Jonah's flight, the flight of the dove, is futile. Let's ask the same question. Can one flee God's presence? Well, Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Says so, plain of day. And the Lord actually was angry with Israel much about this time and removed them from his presence. Yet, of course, he did not effectively translate them geographically. So, can one flee God's presence? Clearly, yes. That's interesting. How are we going to resolve that? There's scripture flatly contradicting itself. Or is it? We can flee the Lord's presence and we cannot flee the Lord's presence. We'll just leave those thoughts there uh, alongside each other and perhaps resolve them a little bit later. But there's a big message in departing the house. As soon as Judas had taken the bread at the Last Supper, he went out. Why do you think we're told that? He went out. It was Passover night. What were you not supposed to do on Passover night? Not supposed to go out of the house. Why not? What would you meet in the streets? Angel of death. That's right. Not one of you shall go out of the door of the house until morning. Do not run away from God. Which house? You might say, well, hang on a minute. That's not true because Jesus went outside the house as well. So Jesus violated Passover law. He went out to the Garden of Gethsemane. But what's given us as literal in the Old Testament all too often has a spiritual meaning in the New Testament. The house of God is no longer just a building. The house of God is the community that is with Jesus Christ. Jesus never fled the company of Jesus, the true house. Of course, that would be impossible. But Judas did, and it was night. And we're told he fled the house and he went from the light of the world out into the darkness. You can flee the presence of God. If God chooses that he wants to find you, he will find you whatever you, you do. But God has said, you have free will. You want to flee my presence, which is almost to commit the greatest sin? Then I'll give you the greatest punishment. I'll let you. And look, let's look also at the attitude that's going on. There's sort of the, who's prepared to save people? Go to the great city of Nineveh, says God to Jonah. Preach against it. Its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away. Now look at this by contrast, and we've read these words already. They're still from chapter 1. Pick me up and throw me into the sea, Jonah says. It will become calm. I know that it's my fault that this great storm has come upon you. But instead, the men did their best to row back to land. And if you see that word row, that's the Hebrew verb chortha. We met that just a minute ago in Amos. It's the verb to dig. So these Gentiles aren't just, you know, whistling while they work and paddling away. They are digging into the sea to try and get back to land. So what do we notice? The Gentiles will work, dig for Jonah's life. They'll say, no, 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 you stay in the boat. If you toss yourself out and sacrifice to your God, maybe it will become calm, but we'd actually like to save your life. But Jonah is completely indifferent to Gentile peril. The Ninevites may die if they don't hear my word and repent, says God. I don't care, says Jonah. I don't like them. They're the enemy. They're attacking my country. So it's the prophet of God that is the least spiritual man in the boat. It's the prophet of God who is indifferent to Gentile peril. And yet there are Gentiles from Tarshish who are prepared to dig into the sea to try and save his own life. So there's tremendous irony in the book of Jonah. It's a very poignant book if we stop and pause and really look at the details that are presented. So there's a failing on the part of Jonah. There's no sympathy for those he doesn't identify with. And again, we're not here to look at Jonah. We're here to look at ourselves. Is that something we recognize in our own community? If we don't identify with someone, we say, well, I don't care whether they understand or not. I don't care whether they're saved or not. They're not one of us. Our, our church and our community is doing well. I don't really care about those outside. This was the challenge Jonah had. 
And this was the indictment that he earned with his own conduct. Spiritual elitism, I call it. You see, Jesus saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So they had no clue what they were doing. Jesus was not moved to sneer at them. Jesus was not moved to belittle them because they didn't have any idea what they were doing and they were supposed to be called by God. Jesus was moved with compassion. Tragically, his disciples were not. Did you notice that? Teacher, said John, we saw someone driving out demons in your name. We told him to stop because he was not one of us. Do not stop him, says Jesus, for no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. The one who is not against me is for us. Jesus says, you might not recognize him as one of your 12, John. Why on earth did you think that he couldn't have known about me, even though you didn't recognize him as one of your group? This is the same problem that Jonah had. He knew who he thought God's people were, Israel, not Assyrians. Assyrians are nasty, horrible foreigners that are supposed to end up dead. It's Israel that counts, and God is teaching a better way. Elitism is natural, but it's not Christ-like. And so now we come to one of the real conundrums of this book. The sea's getting rougher and rougher, so the sailors ask Jonah, what should we do to you to make the sea calm for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, Jonah replied. Then it will become calm. I know that it's my fault that this great storm has come upon you, which it was. Now there's another conundrum. This is why this is really, a, a Jonah is really a, adult material as much as ever it's a Sunday school story. Was Jonah right to offer himself? On the one hand, he's supposed to be a prophet with a message, so he's not supposed to end up dead at this point. On the other hand, He's saying, if I lay down my life, other people will live. And surely that uh, has got uh, a great precedent. So let's see, and I wonder, let's take a, a straw poll, audience participation, but it's not mandatory. Don't join in unless you want to. Little show of hands, you can be discreet as you like or open. Who thinks that Jonah was right to offer himself to save the lives of his fellow soldiers, sailors? I'm seeing some hands. I'm seeing a lot of hands. Okay, well, if I wait long enough, they all go up. All right. Okay, I, got, I didn't count, but I, I got a sense. And who thinks Jonah did the wrong thing to tell the sailors, throw me into the sea and it will become calm? And I'm seeing less hands, but at least some hands. Okay. So what does that already prove? One thing's proven, we're not wasting our time this afternoon, right? We are a community of Bible students, and we've got two opposite opinions in the room. That's actually fantastic, because that means we can, we can sort of move forward and, and try and see if we can resolve that. So I'm excited that not everyone put their hands up for the same option, because uh, that means I might be wasting your time, and, and we're not, good. Um, okay, so great, that's all very well. Where's the answer? Well, I could choose a side and say, you know, this side, not that side, well, that's not gonna help. I don't have any more insight than you do. The questions are always solved the same way, as you know. What would Jesus do? Well, do I have a hotline to Jesus? No, and yes, the Bible. You see, what's interesting is that we do see Jesus, who we know is gonna do the right thing, in exactly the same circumstances. Let me point out just how closely these circumstances match. This is the Jonah panel that will be on your left. The Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and there we are in Mark chapter four, a furious squall came up. Now, has anyone ever been on the sea in a boat in a storm? I have. Okay, quite a few of you. So that comparison could simply be coincidence. That's not very unique. But there's more. The ship threatened to break up in Jonah 1. The boat was nearly swamped, Mark 4. So who's been on the sea in a storm where it was a realistic possibility the boat was gonna go down? I haven't myself. Oh, st yes, yes, that's right. We still have, well, we can still, maybe we can get, get, get this. So it's not fully unique yet, but look at this. Jonah had gone below and fallen into a deep sleep. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. Now at no point are either of those details useful to us spiritually, but here's where they have value. They're so unusual and so unlikely 
and happening in exactly the same circumstances. This is the point at which I say, yes, I think we're supposed to take these two stories side by side. This is a very unlikely match, and I doubt anyone's been in that circumstance. And just in case it's not enough, we even have a fourth detail match. The other sailors say, how can you sleep? Get up and call on your God and we won't perish. And likewise, the other sailors say, teacher, don't you care if we drown? So we now know we've got a perfect match story. If we want to know what Jesus would have done in Jonah's circumstances, we know the answer because Jesus has been in Jonah's exact circumstance. There in Mark chapter 4. What did Jonah do? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, Jonah replied, and it will become calm. What did Jesus do? He stood up and said, quiet, be still. And the wind died down and the storm went away. So I think we can have confidence. Jonah made the wrong choice. That's surprising, isn't it? Because to offer your life to save others, that sounds like perfectly Christ-like, definitively Christ-like. And yet, when Jesus was in the same circumstance, these particular circumstances, he said, no, this is what you should do. Have the faith to stand up and rebuke the storm and it will go away. So therefore, what principle has Jonah overlooked? What did Jesus see that Jonah didn't? Tough question, huh? Faith. And faith in what? And I uh, I think it's right. The faith in the fact God actually doesn't want human sacrifice. God isn't interested in people dying. Jonah has said, I have an angry, judgmental God. And if you give him the blood sacrifices after, all will be well. And Jesus said, my father doesn't want us to perish. Storm, go away. You're annoying me. That's the difference. Jonah lost sight of the fact that God is merciful. If you had to quote a, a, a verse from the Bible to show that God is, is looking for, God is merciful, what, what verse might you choose? That God is not looking for sacrifice, but he is looking for mercy. I wonder if you'd choose that. I desire mercy, says God, not sacrifice, an acknowledgement of me rather than burnt offerings. And look who said it, Hosea, his contemporary to Jonah. So for the sake of drama, I will suggest to you, it's the same day. Jonah's on the boat saying, my angry God needs a blood sacrifice to calm him down. And Hosea is saying, don't listen to Jonah. God desires mercy to show mercy, not just blood sacrifices. If God wants dead humans, don't you think he can create dead humans as many as he wants? He wants people to turn to him. That is something he, quotes, cannot do himself because he's given us free will to choose whether we turn to him or not. Pick me up and throw me into the sea, says Jonah, and it will be calm. I know that my God wants a blood sacrifice. Who else said that? An equivalent of that. Who else says, I've sinned, so I must die now? Absolutely. Judas Iscariot. I'm seized with remorse. I have sinned, says Judas, correctly. Then he went away and hanged himself. I have sinned. And my God would never forgive me. My God doesn't have mercy. My God is an angry God who needs payment for sins. And my life must be that payment. So says Jonah. So says Judas. But the principle is, Jonah has failed. He doesn't see his God as merciful. He sees an angry, legalistic God who's looking for a checks and balances. Certain amount of sins can be paid for with a certain amount of blood. This is a complete misunderstanding of the character of God. It is the essence of discipleship to get to know who God is. So Jonah's story is truly fascinating and at the absolute heart, if, if, if it's your intention at any level to get to know more who God is, then the story of Jonah is absolutely critical for our analysis. Jonah thought, make God mad, pay him off with some blood. That is not who God is. In fact, the whole idea of staying in the boat becomes quite important later on, doesn't it, in the New Testament, when Paul is promised by the angel, yes, we're going to be threatened by a storm, yes, the boat is going to be broken up. It's the same scene again. Stay in the boat, 
says Paul. I was told by an angel, stay in the boat, you'll be saved. Bail out of the boat, disaster may take you. And I think, why is that useful for us to know? How about this? Don't bail out of the ecclesial boat. You think the ecclesial boat won't be hit by a furious squall, metaphorically speaking? Of course it will. You think there might not come a furious squall sufficient to break up the ecclesial boat, to split the ecclesia? Of course, of course it will. But Jonah chapter one, Mark chapter four, Acts chapter 27, are they real to us or not? The message has always been the same. Don't bail out of the boat. Stay in the boat and all will be saved. In Mark, stay in the boat and all will be saved. And the boat was retained in one piece. In Acts, stay in the boat and all will be saved. And in that case, the bro boat was broken up, such was God's will. But stay in the boat for salvation. That's been the message from the Old Testament to the New. Don't bail out of the ecclesial boat. So we've reasoned that Jonah was wrong to sacrifice himself because he failed to perceive God's mercy. So the conclusion of that thought, Jonah places himself beyond God's reach by failing to see God's mercy. And that's what I understand as being beyond the presence of the Lord. When you finally made that decision that God can't save you because he's not really that merciful, then God has said, at that point, I will allow you to be beyond my reach. Not because I can't do anything, but because that's the true terrifying power of your free will, which I will not violate. So lesson, don't run away from God. A, because you can't, and B, because you can. And it, it takes a physicist to be that comfortable with contradiction. <laughs> perfectly comfortable with that. One last thing, let's close this out so we can have a little bit of a break and a stretch of the legs. Remember I, uh, earlier on we put on that mental shelf, jo uh, Jonah is from the tribe of Zebulun. Yeah, what does that tell us? What do we know about Zebulun? There is at least one, arguably two chapters in the Bible that we can go and we can get a bit of a unique flavor from all of the 12 tribes. Genesis 49 is one such place. It's the place where Jacob, the man called Israel, blesses his 12 sons and he gives us a little bit of color and insight into uh, their character. And I, I like to use pictures. So these are the pictures, therefore, that are given us for the 13 tribes, if you will, because Levi is sometimes not inclu included and Joseph breaks into two. Reuben is unstable as water. Simeon is a semi-automatic, no, that can't be right. Uh, Simeon, Simeon and Levi are instruments of destruction. The, the scepter of righteousness never leaves uh, the house of Judah. And then drop down, Asher is spreading fine meats before the king. Gad is a troop. Naphtali is like a beautiful doe with fawns. Dan is the serpent. Issachar is the wild donkey. And from the other end, Benjamin is the ravening wolf. Joseph is the spreading vine. And what was Zebulun? Anyone remember? He was what? He was by the sea. That's, that's uh, yeah, that's very near. It's something to do with being by the sea. You're absolutely on the right topic. Zebulun was to be a safe haven for ships. Okay, so that's, by the sea is a sensible. So here we are at that last verse of chapter one. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. They have now turned to Jonah's God because they see he's a powerful God. So the sailors are guided to safe haven by the prophet of Zebulun, where Zebulun was guaranteed by prophecy to be a safe haven for ships. That's rather beautiful, isn't it? Let me just underscore how beautiful I think that is by putting this out there. This psalm wasn't written for the sailors, but it may as well have been, it's, it fits so well. They cried out to the Lord in their trouble and he brought them out of their distress. He stilled the storm to a whisper. The waves of the sea were hushed. They were glad when it grew calm and he guided them to their desired haven. So Zebulun will become a safe haven for ships, Genesis 49. But notice this one thing, please. If you go back to the book of Joshua and plot it for yourself, Zebulun is landlocked. There is no coastline. Zebulun cannot be a safe haven for ships physically. I suppose you could argue technically being in land would be a very safe haven for a ship, but that's not really the point, is it? Zebulun doesn't have a coastline. 
So Jacob's prophecy is complete nonsense. Either it's complete nonsense or it was supposed to be understood spiritually. And the only Bible character you'll ever meet who's from the tribe of Zebulun is the man called Dove who guided a ship, and the hull doesn't matter, who guided a ship full of people who didn't know God to a safe spiritual haven. And I think that's one of the most beautiful details. That's what happens when you really just dig away inside the scriptures. You find these lovely little gems that just pop up out of nowhere that don't make any sense on the physical plane, but do on the spiritual. Our last slide then. What have we seen from the flight of the dove? God extends salvation to the Gentiles. Jonah was the precedental prophet to the Gentiles, precedentally called to save the enemy. So are you, so am I. How are we doing on that? But Jonah has two principal failings. First of all, he has no sympathy for those he doesn't recognize as his. Do we sympathize with those outside what we understand to be the gospel bounds? And Jonah's second failing, he was wrong to try and sacrifice himself. He lost sight of God's mercy. Do we embrace a God of mercy? Or do we rejoice in a God of judgment and destruction, which we mentally point at persons other than ourselves? And the sailors are brought to safe spiritual haven by the prophet of Zebulun, fulfilling Jacob's prophecy as it could never be fulfilled any other way. Thank you very much, Brother Bill.